Thank you, Mr. Davidson. We'll now begin the question part of the hearing. Each member of the committee will have seven minutes, and I recognize myself for seven minutes. Uh, my first question is for Chief B. Miller. Now that Title 42 has ended, Border Patrol is back to regular processing. Can you walk us through what happens after a migrant has been apprehended, and what elements are covered in the initial processing? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, so from the time of apprehension, uh, the, the group is uh, identified to be in a, uh, a variety of different categories. One, a s of single adults, two, of unaccompanied children, and three, family units. And their um, initial intake from the field uh, is identified, and then they're taken to the appropriate locations to be processed. Once at, they're at the facilities, they receive an initial intake uh, medical screening, and if they require additional medical attention, they are referred to um, a local local hospital for further care. Um, their their um, materials and uh, and uh, items that they have with them are are inventoried and uh, put into safe keep, keeping until they're transferred out of the facility. Then they uh, enter the processing portion where they're screened and records are checked and then a determination is what is, of what is going to, uh, what their path, immigration pathway will be from there. They're asked um, if, they, uh, if they claim fear. Um, if they do, they'll, they'll go through the, uh, one of the uh, credible fear screening processes and uh, turned over to ERO for further, you, uh, um, uh, for further uh, review. Um, and then anybody uh, that withdraws, will be returned uh, back to one of the co contiguous nations that, uh, that we have, uh, uh, Mexico or Canada. Thank you. Uh, my second question is for Mr. Davies. While OFO was operating under Title 42 authorities from March of 2020 to May 11th of 2023, very few migrants were processed at ports of entry. Now, ports across the southwest border process over 1,500 migrants a day. Most of the migrants processed at ports of entry make an appointment on the CBP-1 app, while others wait in line for the chance to be accepted for a walk-in appointment. Does the advance information received through the app help speed up processing time? Uh, what is the average amount of time it takes to process a migrant who schedules an appointment through the CBP-1 appointment app compared to the average amount of time it takes to process a migrant who gets a walk-in appointment? Uh, thank you for the question. So as you pointed out, CBP-1 is used as a scheduling tool. Uh, we do intake uh, from the international boundary line a, a variety of different um, individuals. You know, for OFO, it's legitimate travel in addition to the migrants. And so the use of CBP-1 with an appointment helps us to identify individuals at that limit line who um, are scheduled and ready to be processed. Uh, the process itself varies at, at some of our ports. Uh, in, in some, the... Uh, CBP-1 appointments are sent to our primary inspection location where the, the use of CBP-1 actually helps to uh, pre-populate some of the data that has been submitted as part of the app uh, in the primary inspection, and from there they're referred into secondary. Uh, in, in other ports of entry, we have established a process where they are directly put to secondary um, from the, the limit line. And so the, the benefits of using CBP-1 in terms of time savings and pre-population of data are, are fairly minimal uh, in, in the second circumstance where we really see the savings on our time is the use of the electronic A-file where on average we're saving up to 30 minutes per case by using the electronic A-file. The total average processing time is about four hours for us to process a, a notice to appear case. Uh, if there are different case dispositions, they might take uh, slightly different amounts of time. Thank you, and to follow up, to what extent does OFO coordinate with local NGOs to prioritize walk-in appointments for vulnerable migrants? Yeah, we have the ability to coordinate locally with, with NGOs and, and with, with governments, as, as uh, was pointed out earlier, especially when we talk about uh, releases of individuals into the communities. Uh, we have that ability. We prefer to recognize individuals who have been uh, registered with the CBP-1. And what we really focus on are the individuals that are uh, clear to us to be invulnerable. So we focus on urgent humanitarian concerns, medical, urgent medical emergencies um, to prioritize uh, in addition to those individuals who uh, are, are clearly recognizable as unaccompanied children to bring in from the limit line for processing and prioritization. 
Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bible, um, given the limited number of ERO detention beds, most migrants are released on ATD rather than held in detention. However, migrants with known criminal records or affiliations are generally detained. Could you describe the process between ERO and other federal agencies to determine whether a migrant should be held in detention or released? Thank you for the question. Um, typically, all of our detention cases are, are, are people referred to detention are, are determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, we look at risk of flight, um, potential for being a public safety threat or national security th threat. We also look at mitigating factors of, of you know, lo our longevity of time within the U United States, advanced age, um, medical conditions that might, might militate towards releasing an individual on ATD rather than keeping them in detention. But primarily, we look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis and look for those public safety and national security threats. To follow up on that, what happens when there are no open beds and ICE must decide how to handle a situation with a migrant who has a known criminal history? If the criminal history rises to the level of being a public safety threat, um, I haven't seen in my, my 25 years where we couldn't find a, a bed for an individual um, that has that kind of criminality. We'll make room. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Davidson, in certain Border Patrol sectors, including the U.S. sector, USCIS is conducting credible fear interviews inside Border Patrol facilities. As a result, migrants are ending up staying in Border Patrol custody longer to await those interviews. On average, how long do migrants wait for USCIS to conduct a credible fear interview in Border Patrol custody after a migrant has expressed fear? And how does this compare to the average wait time for migrants who are released on the alternative to detention programs. Thank you, Senator. It's two days from referral to interview and an additional two days from the interview to service of the decision. So it's four days overall in CBP custody, which is a record time for USCIS. The second question would um, be related to our firm program. Um, and then through the firm, which is for family for families, and they're referred to us um, between six to 12 days after um, CBP sends them to the destination cities. And so that's the only comparison I have through the firm process. Um, but certainly what um, we are processing, prioritizing, and, and CBP custody, it's record times in terms of us being able to turn around our decisions. It's four days on average. Thank you. I now recognize um, Ranking Member Langford for his questions. Thank you.